Hello and welcome to Mount Royal University's celebration of International Women's Day hosted by the Faculty of Business and Communication Studies and the Women's Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub. My name is Dr. Leah Hamilton and I'm a professor in the Department of Management and Human Resources at the Bissett School of Business. My pronouns are she, her. As part of our commitment towards reconciliation and decolonization, I wanted to begin by acknowledging that Mount Royal University is located in the traditional territories of the Nitsitapi and the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Siksika, the Pigani, the Gainai, the Sutina, the Stony Nakoda First Nations and home to the Métis Nation Region 3. There are two amazing women here with me today. Nabiha Atala, Advisor for Strategic Initiatives at Immigrant Services Association of Nova Scotia, and Dr. Pallavi Benerji, Associate Professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Calgary. Thank you for joining us today. We are so excited to have you as part of our International Women's Day celebration. So today, the three of us are gonna be talking about how COVID-19 has impacted newcomer and refugee women. Nabiha and Pallavi will highlight some innovative programs that have supported newcomer women during the pandemic and underscore the importance of supporting the women who develop and deliver these programs. So let's get started. Um, can you start by telling us about your current role and how you ended up working in this space? We'd love to hear about your story and positionality in this work. Nabiha, would you like to get us started? Sure, thank you, Leah. Um, my name is Nebiha Atala. As Leah said, my pronouns are she, her, and I live and work on the unceded traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq people, Mi'kmaq. And at ISANS, where I work, we're grateful for the peace and friendship treaties. And we do our best to honor the Indigenous peoples of this territory as we welcome newcomers to join us. Um, so my title at ISANS is Advisor on Strategic Initiatives, and I work on our research partnerships, um, sector best practices, policy issues, government relations uh, with our senior leadership team. ISANS is a large multi-service immigrants settlement agency. Um, we have about 260 colleagues working here. Um, a little bit about myself, I, my family immigrated when I was seven and from Egypt and I went back as an adult and worked in Egypt and first started there to teach English um, as an additional language um, and really enjoyed that work. Um, I got married while I was in Egypt and came back with my husband, so I came back with an immigrant um, and started to teach English. and. When we moved to Nova Scotia, um, I couldn't find work as an English language instructor, but I got in touch with the settlement agency and found that um, there was an opportunity there. And I am still here 25 years later, never a dull moment. Um, I think that although that my journey to this position was a lot uh, directed by my personal situation, it also in the end tied in my education, which had been a um, university degree in urban geography and then social work. Um, but at the time when I did those studies, I had no idea about this kind of work. And so it's been very um, affirming for me to be able to do work that brings together so much of my previous life experience. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Nabiha. Pallavi. Uh, thank you, Leah. Uh, thank you for this invitation. I'm really, really honored. I'm really honored to be with um, two amazing women and to um, meet Nabiha, who does such a wonderful work. Um, and thank you for the land acknowledgement. I also am a guest, immigrant guest, on uh, the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta, which is the traditional territories of the Blackfoot. And my um, pronouns are she and her and hers. And so um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm an associate professor of sociology at the University of Calgary here in um, Alberta. And I uh, came to the University of Calgary about five years back in 2000. 
15. Um, and I came here from the United States where I got my PhD uh, in sociology from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, and then I worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the Vanderbilt University for two years before I got this job and sort of, you know, this was my first tenure track job. But I myself was an immigrant. I came as an international student from India to the United States. And I, I was born and I grew up in India and I got my first master's in India in comparative literature. And after that, I worked for about five years in various, um, nonprofit and developmental organizations, including UNICEF. And I was uh, actually coordinating the youth program first for Eastern India, but then for um, Eastern region in Asia. So various countries across, uh, so Eastern India, Nepal, Bangladesh, and the Philippines. And so I was traveling a lot uh, through you know, this program and then, um, after, you know, for some personal issues, I had to quit my job at UNICEF uh, because they wanted me to move to Cambodia, Laos um, at the time. And my dad had just passed away and I was fairly young and, you know, I'm the only child and my mom was not really ready for me to leave um, back then. So I joined another organization called Children's International and I was doing the same job for them, but it, I was the youth program coordinator, but they had uh, programs across um, various continents and I was sort of coordinating with the youth program coordinators uh, across. And and so I was fairly happy, you know, I this was my first job, it was really exciting. Um, and it was also fulfilling because it was, I thought I was doing really meaningful work and I was uh, traveling a lot, you know, I was, uh, traveling almost for like 15 to 20 days in a month going you know from the remote villages of India to like Manila Philippines to I don't know like it was it was just it was just a really good good exposure to what what the world looks like and then I got really involved in this program which was youth led and it was about uh you know, preventing um marriages of girl children in eastern part of India and it was you know it was completely a ground up program that I developed with the young people I was working with it was their idea and part of uh, what they were doing is advocacy work and one of the ways that they did ad advocacy work was through street theater and art and and it was you know and we saw that it was making a lot of changes you know um there were villages where parents came together to advocate to stop child marriage and then i have this really bright young girl who was working very closely with me she was about 14 at the time um her name is uh, well i shouldn't probably uh you know give her name but uh she was and i was very you know i got very attached to her in the sense of like having a working relationship but i was also young and you know, she was in her teens, so we had this really friendship almost of a connection. And this one particular day, um, and she was a youth leader, she was like leading, you know, uh, all of these programs, and she was making, um, uh, she was making interventions that were really meaningful. And I uh, had my appendicitis burst, like suddenly in my work, and I was in the hospital, and I was actually being taken for surgery when, um, and she called and she usually did not call and the cell phone was new back then and she kept calling and I picked up the phone, you know, right before I was being um, put under and she said, you have to come right now because I'm being married off, right? Oh. And there was nothing I could do at the time because, you know, I barely had time to call one of my colleagues and they really went, but she lived far away. And, you know, by the time um, they went there, she was already married off. And then, then it was basically, um, it would become a big scandal. I mean, she's done well. I think she's happy. I've been in touch, but that was a turning point for me. And I just thought I need to do more to understand 
the social issues that we are talking about. And I have been like talking to sociologists. And at that point, I decided that I wanted to get a PhD to understand the complexities of the topic more. And I applied and, you know, that's how I'm here. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Pallavi. It's interesting. I feel like I know you both and yet I'm learning so much right now. And it's, um, I always find it eye-opening when people do share their stories and then you understand why they're so committed to the work that they do and committed to the advocacy work that they engage in. So thank you. I'd love to hear about the amazing work that you're both doing with newcomer and refugee women during the pandemic. I'm wondering if you can tell me about one or two projects that you've been working on that you're passionate about. Uh, Nabiha, would you like to start? Well, we've had lots and lots of work going on during the pandemic. We were um, fortunate to be able to go from the first day right online because our organization was already doing a lot online and we had um, all our staff equipped, almost all our staff were already equipped with laptops. So um, fortunately for us, the transition to online was a smooth one um, in technical terms, but uh, there were lots of challenges in bringing in our clients uh, online, bringing them in virtually. And at first, we were really concerned that people would not be able to participate because everything was virtual. Um, and we had ups and downs and challenges, but we have a very creative team and very dedicated and people found solutions. And um, so I, I picked a two things out of many that I wanted to share. Um, along with, we have a large language, school, English language school as part of our organization. And the parents who are in language classes are able to bring children to preschool children to our early childhood education center while they're in English class. So we have um, a few hundred children typically in our offices when we're on site um, who now we're staying home with their families. And our very dedicated early childhood education instructors really wanted to keep in touch with the children. So they set up a Facebook group and got in touch with the parents and explained, made sure that every many of them were already on Facebook and that's why that channel was chosen. Um, but then they started to connect with the children um, online on through Facebook, um, started to do some activities um, they did videos for each child. They did a video that they sent them, telling them how much they missed them and that we're all still thinking of you. We're all in this together. Uh, we will keep in touch um, because really this is more than child minding. It's really helping these children in their first introduction to life in Canada and preparation for school in Canada. So there's a lot that goes on when they're on site. Um, and the instructors were able to set it up so that they could read books to the children. They could send activities for the children to do. And that's gone really well. And the parents, this is not directly a, a women's program, but we know that women and families are closely tied. And this was a relief for many of the moms who found themselves at home with their preschool children and not sure how, especially not sure how to help them continue to practice their English um, as the moms themselves are still in need of that. Um, the other program, which is quite different, uh, is our Immigrant Women's Entrepreneur Program. Um, that's a training program that we run uh, for a small group of women at a time, maybe 15 women at a time introducing them to entrepreneurship in Nova Scotia, a little bit about the regulations, the processes, doing a business plan, helping them through um, sometimes the establishment of their business, sometimes the growth of their business. Um, and we had a group that was in session when the restrictions came in. So they had to transition online and 
coordinators of that program were concerned because it had been quite a close group, very supportive. They're, they developed a real network among themselves. But fortunately, that had been strong enough that that carried on into the virtual space. And they were able to complete the program with really good interpersonal connection, which encouraged the coordinators in the next time, which started up online with a new group. And the bonus we discovered there was we had some people joining from out of Halifax, from smaller centers in Nova Scotia, wouldn't have been able to participate in this program otherwise. And really to the surprise, but to the credit of the coordinators, they were able to build the same kind of community online and to the credit of the participants because they really wanted to connect. They really wanted that peer support. And once again, they created a group, even though they never met face to face, um, where they were really able to share their journeys as entrepreneurs, their challenges, the lessons learned, and to move ahead in their plans for their businesses. And we're now in the third group of this since March um, 2020. Um, our third group is running now, also started obviously online and continuing online, although some of our programs are now in person because we're able to open with some safety, but not all our programs. So those are just two examples of many. That's wonderful, Nabiha. It's so interesting to hear about the innovative ways that ISANS um, continued to foster that sense of community, both with families and children and with these women entrepreneurs. Um, as someone who's been trying to build that sense of community with students virtually, um, I certainly appreciate some of the complexities involved with doing that, but also that reward you feel when you think, oh my goodness, these people have never met, and yet you start to see that they're building connections. It's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Pallavi, do you have anything you'd like to add? Sure, thank you, Nubia, that's wonderful. That was so inspiring to hear. Um, so my, you know, the way I came to, so I do research mostly, right? And I do research for the community. Um, so my stories are not as I would say, invigorating and in, in, uh, inspiring, but I have been really inspired by the resilience of the women that I have uh, been working with. So before the pandemic, I had just, finished doing interviews with all of the Yazidi families in Calgary, right? So we interviewed every Yazidi family except for a few families that said no. And um, we were in the process of creating a report for the organization, the immigrant service uh, serving organization that I work with, um, you know, towards um, this research with the Yazidis. It is the Calgary uh, Catholic uh, Immigration Society. And they have been wonderful partners um, who have just given me so much in terms of, you know, their time, their um, support, their love, and, and just connecting me with um, the uh, their clients. But one of the things that um, we, when we finished these interviews, we came out with was the lasting trauma that many of the Yazidi women were harboring, right? And they were trying to get over it and they were very resilient. But, you know, I was writing a paper at the time where I was talking about the trauma as a additional member of the family, right? That lives with, with these families and they just deal with them every day and their relationship with trauma is both one like it's it's really hard and bitter but it's also something that connects them to their past life that they don't want to let go right so when the pandemic hit i was really worried because right before the pandemic many of these women it was about at the two year mark since they had arrived in calgary and they were starting to sort of get out of you know, that that the shell of like trauma and being, you know, they talk about being in the past a lot and they wanted to build a life particularly for their children. And many of the women that I interviewed were single mothers and these were families that were women headed. And and so I was really worried about what what the pandemic is doing and the first lockdown, right? And CCIS just jumped to the occasion and they 
built all of these programs, much like uh, what Nabi had described. They had, you know, um, they developed these um, case files for each of the families that they had as their clients. And, um, and they were doing things like, you know, checking in on clients, but also um, getting them things that they needed. So I started also connecting with, with um, my, you know, the um, women and, and the families that I had interviewed, particularly the, the folks that I thought were the most vulnerable or were, were single mothers, had many children and were struggling a bit, right? And one of the things that uh, struck me was that the pandemic was very hard. The lockdown was very hard because it started triggering memories of cap captivity that they had endured not very long back. And, and they were very um, equivocal about the fact how they had made so much that so they realized how much progress they had made in terms of their mental, mental health abilities. But then you know, the pandemic had set them back and they actually recognized that and they wanted to snap out of that. And that resilience was really something that I walked away with. So it was not that they were being set back, but they did not want to be set back, right? So they were working with CCIS, they were working with me, they wanted to talk to me, they would call me and just wanting to talk and talk about how to get out of this um, this situation, right? And and I think just this idea of reaching out, and I'm trying to like write this idea of reaching out and the reaching out that the women did and worked with um, with the organizations that were trying to support them, you know, hand in hand, I saw them as equal partners in, in that process of coming out of this uh, setback that they had experienced. So that was, that's one of the projects that I have been looking at. The second has been really inspiring for me. So during over summer, when the um, restrictions of over COVID were relaxed a bit. So CCI has, CCI has this piece of land in the city, which is called the Land of Dreams. And they had uh, this land for about two years. And, you know, they procured this land. It didn't have anything. It was pretty barren. And then they, um, I think two years back, they started sort of growing things in the land. And they uh, um, uh, partnered with the Sixka Nation to think about this land from an indigenous perspective and they brought newcomers in and Yazidi women really took to it because the Yazidis are a farming, we a farming community, right? And they did not really see any of the economic options as viable options for them until the land of the dreams came along. But during the pandemic, I went to the land a few times and we had all these workshops that they were doing and I saw a group of eight to nine women and only women, the men weren't going and they were young women. Some of them um, had disabilities and they would travel like, you know, almost 20 kilometers to go to this land and farm and take produce and go back. And so from there, I um, thought of this project about the connection to land and, and, um, and, you know, healing. So how does, how is the land helping um, these women heal both from what they'd experienced before they came to Canada, but also um, this whole you know setback they have had in the pandemic. So that's another project that I am actually working on right now with CCIS and other partners. Thanks so much, Pallavi. That's so interesting, this idea of working with the land in community as healing, especially over such profound trauma um, such as being in captivity. Um, thank you for, for sharing that. That's wonderful. That sounds like a great project. I, I'm sure it will go really well. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping. <laughs> um, so you've both worked so closely with newcomer women and you just both discussed the way the programs that are offered by immigrant serving agencies have such a profound impact on women's lives. I'm wondering how immigrant serving agencies support the women who provide these programs. Um, Pallavi, would you like to start? Sure, yeah, no, thank you for that. So, you know, as, as soon as I had started working with CCIS, I noticed something which was really profound. And one of my 
um, master's students actually um, did her MA project in Gin Sahib Jabahir. She did her MA project on this, this topic. Um, and what she ended up with is, as we were looking at the data, what we ended up with was realizing how much of emotional labor um, the, the CCIS staff were giving, which was beyond the call of duty, right? And, um, and because the Yazidis, the, they came with a certain history and many of them were women, many of them were women who were held captive, who were tortured and, you know, there were mostly women only family. Many of the Yazidi uh, uh, refugees are disproportionately women. So the, the case workers, the managers, right? So I work very closely with Bindu Narula, who is uh, who was the manager of um, the program. Um, she the kind of you know so what we noticed up front was the kind of care that uh, they exuded which was just not just about work right it was not about like the nine to five that they were doing it was they were thinking about oh am i okay okay sorry something happened on my screen and i didn't know what that was sorry yeah. um and uh so one of the things that we came out in the first phase of the um, project was um, the what we call the the maternal care that is provided by um, you know resettlement agency workers, and many of them happen to be women. And 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 so um, there were three categories uh, we identified of of care work. And we are calling them care workers, even though they were resettlement uh, agency workers. So they were the, you know, the managers, people who looked at the program from sort of uh, who constructed and conceived of the program, right? And they did so in um, in conversation with the communities that they were serving. Particularly in my case, I, I saw how they were communicating with the Yazidi women. So the Yazidi women would be uh, invited to their offices to talk about their everyday life. And, and that's where the programming actually was developed. And then there were the mid-level workers with the case workers and the counselors who were in touch with the families every day. And many of them were women who would just, you know, go and visit these families over weekends because they felt you know that they needed that connection and they needed to know that there were people in the city of Calgary that cared for them and this was outside of their job requirements and then there was a, a you know a Yazidi a Liazo person who spoke the language um Keria she um, just became a sister, and 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 so when we were a sister, mother, and um, you know, so this this relationship that was built that was almost familial, and um, when we did the interviews, the Yazidi women would often talk about the women workers as part of their families, and they would you know they would call somebody a sister, somebody like a maternal figure right and they had lost so much family that I think they were making that connection and not everything was like you know they would have the same complaints that they would have of an aunt who was like not listening to them sometimes but sometimes it was just like but it was all I mean the care and the connection and the love was so apparent that uh, we are um, actually I mean you know Nagin's thesis became about that her thesis became about how uh, so there were like four partners in this in this um, you know care work. So the Yazidi women themselves, the resettlement workers at the different levels, and and sort of this community liaison who uh, worked for CCIS but was actually you know part of the community and and who became this um, sort of bridge between CCIS and the community and the community trusted her with their life right so and she was working around the clock 24 7 right so um yeah so I think um there is a huge role of care in the um settlement service work that goes on and much of it is shouldered by women mm -hmm, very interesting 
Um, and I think my understanding is that iSense also sort of recognizes this care that women do and have sort of provided some support to them. I'm wondering, Nabiha, if you can speak a little bit to um, how your organization cares for the people doing the caregiving. Yeah, it's it's something we've been aware of, and and I like the way Pallavi described it, and we that that same kind of commitment, dedication, and extended family feeling is very. I think it's it's part of our sector, and um, it comes with the territory, and it's a wonderful thing. Um, I think that about seventy five percent of our staff are women, and many of us are immigrants ourselves. Uh, many people started at ISANS as clients. Uh, some as volunteers. Um, so the lines are not, it is not clear demarcation all the time. And uh, there is a heavy load carried, especially by frontline workers who work with refugee clients who have lots of needs. They're our most vulnerable clients. And they had a big burden to carry during COVID because a lot of our clients, um, are when they arrived, were illiterate even in their first language. And so to, to go from being in a classroom where you're starting to learn to read and write for the first time, first time in school, and then to have a computer to have to be the means of communication was I think a big, another sort of culture shock for people um, after the culture shock of immigration. So we tried very hard to keep the connection um, and that did that does take a toll on on the people who are doing the caring. Um, but fortunately, we were also able to provide a lot of supports for our staff. And we have a communications team, which is great. And they really stepped up the communications and our people and culture team who are administrative teams who don't work frontline with clients really stepped up in COVID to support the staff. Um, and our communications team created a new section on our intranet called iSANS at Home to help people transition to working at home and stay connected with each other. So we had virtual lunch hours for the first several months, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, you could open on Zoom and eat lunch with your colleagues and you could have those chats that really can relieve tension and relax you in the middle of your work day and help you to move on. Um, we they posted all sorts of resources about mental health. That was a real priority to acknowledge that we're all struggling with our mental health. It's nothing to be ashamed of. We need to acknowledge it and help each other with it. Um, we did special activities like a lip sync battle for staff or people videotape themselves lip syncing and we all got to vote on the winners um, and we soon discovered that it was really challenging for a lot of women because their kids were home <laughs> and they were trying to take care of their kids as well as do their work and so we started to put resources on our intranet for families and for kids activities that kids could do um, and in fact it was lovely because it's really a huge stress relief to be able to take your personal life, to acknowledge your personal life in your work life, to acknowledge I'm a mom, I'm having a really stressful day, I'm going crazy, or I'm single, I'm really lonely. <laughs> I'm feeling very strange not seeing people. Um, so we had a lot of meeting places created online for our staff that were really valuable. Um, unfortunately, as well, in Nova Scotia, you may remember in September, we had a mass murder situation that was very frightening, shocking, and for many immigrants, re-traumatizing. The idea that somebody was out there killing people and that he had commandeered a police car and was using that um, RCMP car vehicle um, was very scary. Um, and so we set up sessions. We offered sessions for our um, clients to talk about their feelings, to work through them all online. Uh, we 
we had to learn to do things online. Um, we had sessions for staff as well. And the same again with uh, the killing of George Floyd and all the reaction to that. It was like, what next? <laughs> it was a very hard time that these uh, very shocking events were taking place when we were all isolated. Um, but we tried our best to set up meeting places virtually and to really talk about how we felt. We brought in professional counselors who would um, lead these sessions. And it was, I think it was really helpful. And we connected with each other in different ways through, we are still connecting with each other in new and different ways through COVID. We have to make a more conscious effort um, to support each other personally, uh, which is so important. We, we do it kind of spontaneously when we're face to face. Um, but we all recognize that we need each other and we need to be able to um, have some personal chat as, as well as the business talk online. And I think that we are doing that and we are feeling that, um, that support. And the other, I would just add one more thing that's been challenging that we've, uh, I think, been able to talk about is the concern for families overseas where COVID is not so well controlled and where we hear, you know, it's hard enough to be far from your family, but when there's severe illness, it's really scary. Um, and I think that's another issue we've talked about together um, in various combinations and permutations of our uh, organization because it, it has hit home for a lot of people. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Nabiha. It's really interesting to hear of all the ways that ISANS is um, providing support and caregiving to the, the um, people that work at ISANS who are then providing the caregiving and just the recognition of, of our, our whole lives, right? And I, I appreciated what you said about how sometimes the blurring of the personal and professional is actually welcomed. And I certainly feel that sometimes as a community engaged researcher where, you know, there's lots of evenings and weekends and, but it's nice to have, you know, babies crawling over me or to be able to bring my little one with me and she's just welcomed with open arms. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. So I have one final question uh, for both of you and that is for our students and alumni who are listening to this. What would you recommend for those who want to take sort of a deeper dive into some of the issues that you've raised today? Is there a book or a podcast or a different resource that you'd recommend or a way for people to get involved? Pallavi, can we start with you? Sure. I just want to acknowledge what Nabiya said before before jumping in. And I think, you know, the kind of work that Nabiya people like Nubia and her colleagues do uh, in the even in the organization that I work with um, is so inspiring and I'm you know I'm inspired every day and when I think of like the weight of the pandemic I just look up to um, you know the community workers and it just you know and especially the transnational bit of it that Nubia touched on is very important and I think um, with that I will actually say that for the for that, I'm, I'm going to recommend a fiction uh, which really touches on this aspect of transnational lives that a lot of us live, right? We live across spaces and times and, um, and those lines blur as well between the private and the personal. And you know, often, I mean, I talk, have talked to my um, participants and they, they often say that sometimes we wake up in the morning and we forget whether we are in Iraq or Syria or Myanmar and then we realize oh we are in Canada and it's like minus 20 outside you know and 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 that happens to me and I know like my grandmother was a refugee from Bangladesh to India and she talked about the same thing and so this book really resonated with me it's called The Map of Salt and Stars and it's by Jennifer Zainab Jugadar, and she is um, she's a daughter of a um, you know a Syrian family who grew up in United States. But she talks about this 12th century girl who you know who was this really inspiring 
figure and she attached herself to that historical figure to make sense of her life in in the United States and Syria she goes back with her mother to Syria and you know their uh, house gets bombed and so she just kind of attaches herself to this inspiring figure a woman who um, had a girl who dressed up as a boy to survive through you know her life and so it's a story of queerness it's a story of uh, journey it's a story of transnational lives, the personal and the professional. And then there is another book that I think is uh, for more academic, you know, students who want to pursue this academically. It's called uh, Refugee Beyond Re Reach, How Rich Democracies Repel Asylum Seekers. And it's about how, you know, there are structures that make uh, lives of refugees more difficult. It's by David Fis Scott Fitzgerald, who's a sociologist. So these are the two books. And I really like two podcasts that I would like to recommend to students. And one is The Borderless Voices. And it's, you know, it's stories of refugees in Canada. And, you know, it's, it's personal stories and how border crossing happens. and the meaninglessness of borders is what they really highlight. And then the Global Migration Podcast, which has been doing a lot on COVID and issues around COVID and how it affects refugees and immigrants. So, and finally, I would just say that to students, just reach out and see what's in your community and where you're needed, right? And I think um, reaching out is so important. That's something I've learned from working with the community organizations that I work with, as well as the women that open has opened up have opened up their lives and stories with me. Wonderful. Thanks for those excellent recommendations. Um, and Nabiha, any recommendations from you? Mm -hmm. I, I want to say thank you to Pallavi. I wrote those down. <laughs> I'm looking forward to checking them out. And I love that you included a fiction book there because I find often that fiction touches me more deeply. Right. Yeah, and so it's great to have that. I just, um, I'd like to tell people about two websites that I think are are, um, are really well done. One is the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, unhcr.ca. Mm -hmm. um, and they have a huge section of stories with photographs. Um, and it really gives you a global perspective, but of individuals in that bigger context. Um, and I think it's really valuable to understand the situations people are in before they come as refugees, to think about what it was like, what it is like, because a very, very small percentage of refugees are resettled. The, like, the majority of refugees in the world are still um, perhaps in countries close to their own or in their own home, but they've been displaced. So really what we see in Canada when we bring refugees here is a very thin slice and um, it's good to keep the global perspective. Uh, but for the local, I would recommend um, our Canadian government website, Immigration Matters. Um, and that has stories of immigrants, but also information about immigration, um, how it works, immigration programs for people who want to understand that context. Um, it's very nicely, clearly laid out and explained, and it can be helpful to, if you're in discussions, um, we who work with immigrants often find ourselves outside our work in discussions with people who disagree with us, who don't understand what immigration and immigrants are about. And sometimes we don't have responses to challenging questions, or we don't understand enough. Um, and I think that immigration matters um, is a good, offers some good backgrounders if you want to address specific issues of immigration in Canada. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Naviha. I want to thank you both for joining us in celebrating International Women's Day with Mount Royal University's Faculty of Business and Communication Studies and the Women Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub. I am so inspired by the incredible work that both of you do. You create so much positive change in our community, and I'm deeply grateful to know you and to have learned from you today. 
Um, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, and I want to thank our listeners for tuning in and joining in the celebration of women, and I want to wish everyone a happy International Women's Day. Thank you. Same to thank you. you. Same to you. Happy International Women's Day. <laughs>